It's my pleasure to welcome Chris Ray. Uh, he's an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science at Stanford. Uh, he is the, in the Stanford AI Lab, and he is affiliated with the Machine Learning Group and the Center for Research on Foundation Models. Um, his uh, recent work is to understand how software and hardware system will change uh, because of machine learning. Um, he has done a research work that has been incorporated into scientific and human, humanitarian efforts, such as the fight uh, against human trafficking, along with products from technology and companies including Apple, Google, and YouTube. Um, he received the MacArthur Foundation Fellowship. Uh, his uh, research contribution has spanned database theory, database systems, and machine learning. And his work has won best paper uh, at PAUS 2012, Sigma 2014, ICML 2016, uh, NeurIPS uh, 2020 Test of Time Award, which is a very uh, prestigious award, and the PAUS uh, 2022 Test of Time Award as well, and on and on. So uh, I'm very excited to uh, introduce Chris this afternoon. Thank you so much for the, for the warm introduction. It's great to be here. This is a, a fantastic space. This is my first time here, and the, the deck and the weather is just really amazing. So what I'm going to talk about today are some building blocks for foundation models that we've worked on. But first, what I thought I would do is tell you kind of why did I fall in love with foundation models. So the three questions driving this talk, and they'll be roughly in, in kind of three sections, is you know, how does foundation models change the systems we build? And I'm a systems builder. I'm an engineer at heart. Uh, you know, I do AI on the weekends, I guess, or I guess during the week uh, now. Um, but I really love to build things that people use. And I was blown away by how foundation models change pretty much every aspect of it. So I'll share one little slice there. I like to make things go fast. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how we can make these models efficient. I'll talk a little bit about an idea called flash attention um, and give you the underlying idea of why making things IO aware is likely going to be something that you'll want to do again and again and again, um, which is something you know, that came out of the lab and is wonderful. And then the last part of the talk, I'm going to, if I have time, I'll describe some of these new models. And basically, the thing that's motivating this work is not you know, some dislike of the current models. It's this idea that AI can actually be deployed in a ton of different places. But more interestingly than being deployed in a bunch of places, just kind of inwardly focusing as an AI person, how kind of narrow is our recipe? How rare is our recipe? Right now, we have kind of one recipe that almost everybody's using. We kind of tweak it in various different ways. I'm just intellectually curious. like. What else could we do? Are there more efficient things that we could do? Are there things that we could do in different domains? And so I'll talk a little bit about that work. These are things like S4 and Hyena, uh, if you've heard of them, right? So how did I learn to love uh, foundation models? So the way I learned to love them was I was working on probably a problem that will bore most of you if I spend too much time on it. It's a problem around kind of how do you clean data. And this work was really done by three folks, Ivanka, who's now a PhD student, Anez Shami, who was a PhD student, uh, math, computational math person, but now is running a company uh, called Number Station. And Laurel Orr was one of my postdocs who joined Inez, uh, my former student, running that company. Okay. So just to level set, I'm sure Percy already covered all of this, because these are his slides from a, a course we taught last winter. What are these autoregressive language models? Well, to a first approximation, they, they're giant neural models that compress a corpus with next word prediction. Okay? So they, they're basically taking all of the information that's there, they're compressing it in this nice kind of neural net way. And then this allows you to get the conditional probability autoregressively to generate the next token. Okay? So you, the mouse ate the blank. Well, you've seen cheese enough times or things that look like cheese. You'll generate cheese as the next token, which is wonderful. A year and a half ago, I had to tell people what these are, but probably all of you have used ChatGPT or BARD, so you know, this is probably very intuitive now, which is funny that these are you know, a year old. And the last piece, which I was really interested in and why I did fall in love with them in 2019, actually at Apple, was every single sentence, token in a sentence is an example. And I was really into the weakest forms of supervision we could possibly get to learn, just because I think it's interesting. And so I was like really set up to resonate back in the Elmo Burt days, like what was going to happen in self-supervision. So foundation models were just a name that actually I don't really like, but we came up with at Stanford on this paper that had like 350 people, everyone who came by on a Wednesday or something. And it was because people are really excited about this at Stanford. I shouldn't be so glib. Percy did a lot of work on that. So foundation models are basically these autoregressive neural language models, huge numbers of parameters, very large training corpora. 
but you know, we, we are just in our infancy of understanding them. One thing that they had, which blew me away, especially in kind of the GPT-3 timeframe that everyone's kind of aware of now are these emergent behaviors. So you take, for example, some text, get capital from country, you give it a couple of examples in natural language text, you ask it to complete the pattern, and lo and behold, you know, out pops the answer, it generates those tokens. Okay? Again, we're all familiar with this. And of course, there's now things where you can, it didn't just learn to do answering that question, it learned how to do translation, it learned how to do trivia and QA, it learned how to do arithmetic, actually not so well, uh, but it learned all these things kind of pretty much automatically. Okay? So now what does this have to do with problems I care about? Now I'm not a huge Swifty, she's great, but this is the only non-grim picture on the web I could find of death by a thousand cuts. So what is a death by a thousand cuts problem? A death by a thousand cuts problem is something I mean where each individual kind of task that you have to solve sub problem is actually really easy. You look at it and you're like kind of embarrassed to talk about it. Like why doesn't the machine do that? But the sheer variety and breadth of those problems, that's what gets you, okay? So let me show you the death by a thousand cuts problem that I was working on for actually a couple years. And weirdly was like kind of convinced we wouldn't be able to solve it. Uh, you know, in any reasonable amount of time. So there's this problem called data cleaning. So data cleaning is an old classical problem from data management. I give you a table. That table contains errors. You want to fix the errors, okay? So how do you fix the errors? Well, how do you know their errors? Well, there are some things you may know, like logical kind of constraints. You know that every address has a unique zip code, but here I have two zip codes for the same location. I know there's an error. So I would like to be able to know there's an error and fix it. There are obvious typos. You know, Chicago minus an H is probably still Chicago. There's probably not a city that looks like that. Okay? There's weird things about the data distribution. My point is every one of those things, you're like, yeah, that seems pretty easy. But the problem is the reason this problem was hard and people spend so much money on it is, it's just this death by a thousand cuts feel. There's hundreds and thousands of these instances, right? So in like circa 2017, these jokers showed up in my lab. Uh, Ihab Elias, who was at Waterloo at the time, Shu Chu, who's now a professor at Georgia Tech, and Theo Rakatsinas, who's now at Apple, but was a professor at Wisconsin. And we used like machine learning and weak supervision to solve it. The details don't matter. At the time, it was a huge jump in the state of the art, just being able to take in weak supervision and start to embed these things. And actually, Apple acquired these folks, uh, and they're still at Apple right now. The thing is, what I'm trying to point out here is Ehab actually also founded an earlier data cleaning company called Data Tamer, which is still running. Like these people were really trying to solve this problem. It wasn't like a benchmark that they were climbing. This was like what they spent their time on, okay? So then enter Ivanica. Ivanica is one of those, oops, one of those amazing human beings. Uh, she was an undergrad at the time. I was giving a keynote at Sigma. They invited me back. I'm, you know, I don't think databases or AI would claim me as their own these days, but they invited me back and said, what have you been doing? I was like, foundation models, let me tell you about it. So this was last year in like May or so. So I said, Ivanica, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back to all those benchmarks where we're state of the art and we're just gonna run GPT-3. No one in my lab wanted to do it, honestly, but Ivanica was game because she's like game to do anything. Friday afternoon, I kind of tell her the idea. Literally by Monday morning, she comes back with results. So here are the results. Is there an error in the country, right? So this is how we were phrasing it. This is zero shot. Right? You're just feeding in the examples one after the other with like the same prompt. It works, and by the way, it's amazing that it works. I just wanna be very clear that it works zero shot because it was never trained to do this. It wasn't trained to fix these errors or do anything, but that knowledge was just kind of baked in there. She's like, okay, well maybe not zero shot. What if I go few shot? I add in a couple more examples. All of a sudden it becomes state of the art. And that's wild because she could add in those few shot prompts again, over a weekend with like a very limited amount of text mining, okay? And in fact, this has been documented a bunch of times, you can go try it for yourself. And this is wild to me. This is why I love foundation models so much. It has that breadth of kind of junk knowledge that you need in the environment to solve these problems, they're in there. If you look at any one problem, kind of the magic sometimes disappears. Because if you look at an old school machine learning problem and you look at it with a foundation model, you're like, wow, this is overkill. But if you look at these kind of real world problems or some subset of these real world problems that have this death by a thousand cuts feel, they're super interesting. And I don't know another way to solve them. Now you could look and say, the open AI people are really smart and they are really smart, they're awesome. Um, I think at least a couple of them deserve the Turing Award, but you know, I'm biased. But anyway, you could say, is it just GPT-3? It's not. This thing is incredibly robust, this phenomenon is robust. This is J1, Jurassic One, uh, which is a, another company called AI21. This was their model last year that we ran, basically the same performance, okay? Below is the open source, that's Llama and Llama 2, right? Already it's actually a little bit better in some ways than what was, what was done a year ago. 
and the reason this is important to me, by the way, is I'm an open source kind of zealot. People always ask me, is the open source hopelessly behind industry? So, well, if it's 10 years behind, we're toast. If it's six months behind, well, there's a lot of problems that it's going to be able to be applicable to. It won't do everything, but it can do a lot. And so I think this is a little bit of evidence that, hey, maybe these open source things are, are pretty legit. The prompts are not universal. This is kind of a detailed point. This, I think, is going away a little bit. But of course, there's a lot of really good work in like ICML and iClear about how you deal with reformulating prompts. What's the science of it? I think we're still in the early days. You know, I think Andrew has a wonderful class on prompting, if I'm not mistaken, that's coming out relatively soon. One thing I should also mention, my view of these things, and when we'll talk about efficiency, the reason I started to get into so much into efficiency is already these models are two to six x smaller than GPT-3. One thing I think it's important to keep in mind, these models grew up in an area where there was no TCO, there was no total cost of ownership. We were building them effectively if people were contributing to them because they were awesome. That was it, that was the goal. Look how awesome it is. When I make it bigger, it's more awesome. If you wanna do that thing more efficiently, and the example you, know, you can kind of glibly use is, do you want your point of sale device to know how to summarize French literature? I think that's a better world to live in, honestly. I would like my point of sale device to summarize French literature, but I don't pay the compute costs. If I pay the compute costs, I probably have a different view. So that TCO is gonna change where and when these models are used. All right, so this is kind of the application summary. These death by a thousand cuts problems are really interesting to me. There's a bunch that come up in NLP and other areas that we were working on. And again, it's thousands of sub problem, each easy, but the breadth is hard. That's where foundation models really resonated to me and why I started to work. And I also just wanna point out, open source did catch up pretty quickly, uh, which is exciting. and means that a lot of people can contribute to pushing the state of the art. Now, you may look at this and say, like, I don't care about these robots, you know, cleaning out toilets. What do I care about? And I'll just say there are other death by a thousand cuts problems that are really exciting to me. Now, I'm not a roboticist, but I have friends on the faculty who are. And one of the things that came out just recently was this paper I just think is super cool, so I wanted to bring to your attention, which is this OpenX embodiment uh, data set, an RTX. This is really cool to me. The thing to me that I clued me in is I went to every robotics talk, because I'm just a curious person. And every time I would go, I would ask, why is that thing hard? Why is that grasp hard? And they would always say the same thing. Well, there's like a thousand things going on that you have to get right. That one isn't hard, but they are. It had that death by a thousand cuts vibe. So I'm really excited that, you know, some of my friends who are the smartest people I know uh, in that area are starting to think in this way of how do we build foundation models for them. And I bet there are a ton of other areas that I'm just not as exposed to where I think this paradigm uh, can actually be quite valuable. So I just wanted to share it with you. All right, on to the more technical part of our talk. Um, Foundations of foundation models. By the way, all these images are generated with Dolly 3. My wife is like, oh, you're a Stanford professor. What does it mean that you have to work on your talk? And I'm just sitting there generating these stupid images. So she doesn't take my work very seriously, and, and nor should she. Anyway, so recall, this won't help you if you haven't seen a transformer block before. I apologize, but just to set context, if you remember the way the transformer works is you have a sequence mixer, which is a multi-headed attention, and then it goes to a feed-forward network, which is the channel mixer on top, it runs per channel. In this talk, I'm gonna mostly talk about the multi-headed attention and what we can do there for a variety of reasons. In the last part, if I have time, I'll sneak back to the feed-forward network, okay? The other bit of background I wanted to share with you is the components of a modern GPU. I like to make things go fast. GPUs are pretty amazing. There are two things to keep in mind here. One is the memory hierarchy of a GPU. There's, as always, a memory hierarchy, meaning there's some small but very fast memory. That's traditionally registers or SRAM. And then there's slower, uh, but much bigger memory, that's HBM. That's the number that's usually quoted with the GPU. That's the memory size they tell you. And the difference between them is orders of magnitude and how fast they can move data. Okay? Registers are extremely fast. It's about three orders of magnitude slower to go to HBM. Okay? The second trend, which I'll highlight more in the next slide, is that on modern accelerators like the H100, a vanilla computation where you just kind of call and use things gets you about 67 teraflops. But if you actually just want to run gems, that is matrix multiplies, because those are dense computations that they've specialized generation over generation, they're much, much faster. And I'll talk about how much faster, okay? So the point is, is in our lab, we don't think about like multiplication as the key object a lot of times. We think about matrix multiply as the key object of the right size to fit in a tensor core, okay? And these trends are, are actually fundamental. I don't think, you know, all the accelerators basically have the same characteristics in various different ways. So this is a chart that my student Dan put together, Dan Fu, who's on the market this year if you want to hire people. Uh, Dan put this together and what what you can see here is that generation over generation, the amount of acceleration that you get relative to the baseline is increasing. So even though the baseline is increasing of how fast the underlying chip is, 
the penalty for not using the tensor cores, those matrix multiply units, is getting bigger and bigger. So you really got to take advantage of them, OK? And this is fundamental, as Mark Horowitz, my colleague, says basically every meeting. Uh, all that matters is locality. All that matters is that you, once you get there, that power and energy just dictates that you're going to want to do these dense, relatively small operations very, very fast. OK. okay. So the main idea of flash attention, because I have this weird database roots, was like, OK, this looks to a first approximation. In fact, that triangle is something that like database people use when they used to talk about main memory and disks all way back when. And they would do operations that were called IOware operations, like joins. Okay? In the past life, I worked on those joins. So the idea here is that what we're going to do is every time we bring a block of memory in, which is going to be kind of roughly tensor core sized, maybe a little bit bigger, honestly, every time we bring one of those those things into memory, we're going to do as many operations as we can, and we're going to try and minimize our, pa our number of IOs back and forth to HBM. That's going to be our metric. We're not going to worry too much about like compute overall. We're going to worry a lot about how often we're shuffling data, and we're going to optimize everything to minimize data shuffling. Okay? Now, the other corollary of that is when you bring something in to memory, you do as much as you can on it. And this is something which is now done by graduate students. You tell the graduate student, <laughs> fuse all the kernels by hand, and then you try and find really brilliant graduate students. And the brilliant graduate student who did this is Tree Dao, who's like the owner of Flash Attention, which I'll talk about multiple times. And that fusion is saying, the problem is, is what a GPU will normally do is go back and forth to memory if you don't fuse a bunch of operations. So you kind of have to do this. And there are more tools that are coming out to do this, like you know the modular folks, uh, Chris Latner and team, they're doing stuff that looks like this, nearly automatically PyTorch compile. That's where it works. But we're going to focus on the IO piece. So here's a simple way that attention works at a high level. This is just kind of algorithmic. And then I'm going to talk about how to make it IO aware. So you have Q and K that come in. These are the the, the query and the key vectors, and then V, which are the vector of the data, and your goal is to produce O. And here's the algorithm. You compute the attention scores, Q, Q, uh, Q times K transpose. This is an N by N matrix. Effectively, it's telling you the score of how much every sequence item is paying attention to any other sequence item. You'd like that to be a softmax, so you have to normalize. First, what you do is you compute the weighted score. So you multiply the attention by the vectors, and then you compute that normalization to get the softmax, right? The softmax is exp of all the values, and then you divide by the sum, okay? And I'm ignoring numerical issues and a bunch of real details that are under the covers, but not too many, right? The Triton code, by the way, is pretty cool for this. If you haven't played with Triton, like, try it out. The tutorial's great. Phil's an amazing dude. Any case, then you do the divide and you return it, okay? All right, so how does flash attention work? It's super simple, hopefully, if I did my job right. On the bottom is the algorithm from the last slide. Let's make it IO aware. So here we have one block of Q just for slideware, two blocks of K, and two blocks of V. So how does it work? We load Q, K, and V. We compute the attention scores, which is a new page. We compute the normalization constants, which I'm going to call Z1. We compute the output, the normalized output, and we free the, uh, free the elements. Now, one thing there should worry you. The normalization for the output's actually wrong. And the reason it's wrong is it hasn't seen the other values in the softmax, the other parts of the denominator, because those exist only in k after you've done the dot product q and k. So this output is wrong right now, but we're going to fix it up in just a second. The way you fix it up when you load uh, k and v is you again compute the attention scores. You compute the normalization, which is now good up to the second chunk, so the old scores plus the new scores. You compute the output. But you have to add back the vectors from the first block. How do you do that? Well, you renormalize them. They were kind of 1 over z1. That was their normalization. Now you multiply z1 over z2. They're z2 normalized. It's just like a running average. Nothing else is going on under the covers. And boom, you do your free. OK? So all you need to do if you think about this is keep the last bit of output and the last normalization. And you have yourself a pretty nice IOware algorithm. OK? All right. So when we brought in blocks, we fused many operations. That's what's going on. Sorry for all the clicking. In that small uh, code block there, that was fusion, is what's really happening there. When we aggregate across vectors, the Vs, that's something called algebraic uh, normal, uh, aggregations, just renormalization. It's how you compute a running sum. And there are a couple more fun details. Flash Attention 2 does a better job in worker balancing. There's a ton of little parallel workers. How do you keep them all busy the same amount? You have to get the memory layout right to feed into the tensor cores. 
and you have to do this trick called recomputation. Sometimes it's faster to just recompute something rather than to store and write it to memory. And that's an easy like envelope calculation that you can do because these devices are very predictable. It's not like the internet, like they're inside and it's all silicon. Okay. So hopefully that seems super simple and you're like, well, that, people couldn't use that. That seems pretty dumb. No, they do. It's like two to four X faster, the first version uh, that was there uh, on A100s. And it's a huge memory reduction because perhaps counterintuitively, you're only looping over the Qs and the Ks once, just like a join. You're not actually doing all cross products, which previous implementations were doing. And if you're like, well, that sounds fun, I'll try and use it. Maybe you have. I mean, thanks to the wonderful people at MLPerf, treated a bunch of work. Uh, it's in PyTorch now, Hugging Face uses it. Um, you know, as I mentioned, Phil Tillett put it into Triton, the OpenAI thing, NVIDIA releases it. It's awesome, it's in a bunch of places, okay? And one of the things that I put this little quote from Sam, which I loved, which is like, we were really motivated by, you know, these things start to work when the sequence length gets longer and longer. And I'll come back to that in the next part of the talk. When the sequence lengths are short, then blocking doesn't matter so much. When they get really long, that's gonna be where things get really sporty and interesting. This is late breaking work. I just wanted to do this because it's Tree. I had nothing to do with this work. Uh, Meta and Together did this. Tree and a bunch of folks from Meta did something called Flash Decoding. It's available at Together, also available in Code Llama. It's way faster. It's the same blocking idea applied to inference. Um, and if you're sensing a pattern here that like Tree does this stuff, you're right, Tree's amazing. You should, you know, he's going to Princeton, he's at Together, you should be very nice to him. I guess one time when the ML Perf people, he was on a date and he walked by ML Perf having dinner on Castro and Mountain View and they gave him a standing ovation and that very much impressed his girlfriend. So uh, please keep it up, a applaud to him whenever you see him. He is really amazing and a sweet human being um, and just a really wonderful guy, okay? All right, so in the next part of the talk, what I wanna discuss is, can we remove attention? Okay. That may be a perverse thing to do. You're like, well, it works so great and we just made it fast and you know, we, we learned about IO stuff. Like, why would we do this? I don't know, seems fun. I, I'm a researcher, I don't care. Now, this talk, by the way, is a much worse version of a talk that Sasha gave. If you're not following Sasha Rush, you should really check out Sasha. He's unbelievable. He's a, like embodies the reason that I switched into to AI like a decade ago. People are technical, they're really smart, but they're also really nice and wonderful human beings. And Sasha is all of those things. And he gave a great keynote, which I linked here, um, about do we need attention and kind of got the state of the art about, I would say six months ago. A lot's happened since then, but man, if you're not following Sasha, you're, you're making a mistake. He's brilliant. He also has these cool transformer puzzles, which we like teaching in class. He's awesome. Any case. All right. So let me give you a practical motivation about why I'm going to talk about long sequences. And I say I mean this 50%. I mean the other things I'm going to say a little bit more. So what do I mean, the practical case? We say, well, Text is huge. Text has hundreds of thousands of tokens in a book. Audio, a minute of it is a million samples if you go at 16 kilohertz. Biology, you know, full DNA is billions of base pairs, but a chromosome is about 2.5 million. And video and images are like long sequence data. So we were interested in this. When we started this line of work, all the models were maxing out at about 512 tokens, okay? Way too small to deal with these kind of data sets. And as I pointed out, because of that QK transpose, Transformers are scaling quadratically. So as the sequence length grows, they get slower and slower and slower, okay? Relative to what we might want. So today we've done two things. The first part already, we figured out how to make better hardware aware algorithms. And that kind of gets us up to the 32K range. As hardware gets better, that will increase, which is great, but that's taking advantage of the hardware. The other thing I'm gonna talk about in the last couple of minutes here, or the last 15 or 20 minutes is, how do we deal with new models that can go up to a million or a billion sequences? And there's lots of models here that are really cool and we have a, a web page and other stuff coming. It's not just ours, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about ours because I know them best. Now this one I mean, this is why we were actually working on it. So it's nice that like there were all these data sources that were out there that were practical, but one really interesting thing to me was how valuable is inductive bias? It was one of those things that I would go to talk after talk and they would say, oh, this is a good inductive bias. And it kind of felt like, you know, motherhood and apple pie. It was like a good thing. You had a good inductive bias when things went well. And I was like, well, that doesn't tell me what to do next. So I started to kind of take a contrarian view and say like, how much do we need it? So let's try and figure out examples where it's kind of weird to do. So we worked on this problem, which is sometimes called sequential CIFAR or those variants, where you take an image and you basically lay it out as a vector. Okay, so just imagine this is one pixel deep, but I'm just gonna take the image and I'm gonna lay it out. We even work on variants where they're permuted, the pixels are permuted. And the reason we care is we wanna know how well we can do on this problem of classification because we've destroyed all the spatial bias. We've destroyed kind of all the biomimetic stuff that we say about how the human eye works here. Human eyes can't, as far as I know, can't do one you know, pixel wide classification. 
And when we started doing this, sequential CIFAR was about 30 points down compared to looking at an actual image. So it looked like it mattered. So we're just curious, how much does it matter? And again, if it turns out to matter a lot, great. And if it turns out not to matter too much, also great. It's just curiosity. Now, we weren't the only ones thinking about this. And this benchmark uh, came out while we were working, and it was a godsend for us. So Yitay's team and a bunch of wonderful folks from Google Brain and also DeepMind, this wonderful, important benchmark where they were trying to drive uh, transformers to longer and longer sequence length to try and figure out how they would break. So they were thinking about very similar things, but they were focused really on transformers, and we call this benchmark LRA, long range attention. And it's a wonderful benchmark they produced. Two things I want to draw your attention to here. The first thing is that image column, that's the kind of sequential CIFAR column that we're talking about. That's effectively what that is. And you see these numbers are way lower than what you would get with like a standard, even ResNet on these uh, kind of images. The other thing to look at is path X. The reason they are X's is that no model was better than random guessing on this. So you would ask, you know, are these two dots connected in an image? And all the models would fail. And there are variants of this to higher and higher resolution, which are pretty interesting. So how did people deal with this? Now, there are three ways. The first way is to improve on hardware. We've been doing that the last couple of years. A second way, which is super cool, I won't talk about, but I'm really interested in, uh, we didn't write any of these papers, are on approximating attention. So maybe instead of a quadratic attention, you do something that's a little lower. There's some theoretical obstacles you have to get around. There's a wonderful paper about why they're theoretical obstacles to approximating attention perfectly. But there's a ton of really exciting work over there. The third one is these alternate paradigms. I'll talk about Hippo S4 and those folks, but CKConf, S5, RKQ, uh, RKWV, all these different models are basically like, let's go back to RNNs and LSTMs, which kind of failed the last time around because of vanishing gradients, and see if some of our modern techniques can just scale them up. Okay? All right. So roughly what we're going to do is we're going to rip out this MHA box, and we're going to replace it with signal processing ideas. Okay. And I'll explain to you what we get out of signal processing. And unfortunately, there will be integrals. But you shouldn't have to know what any of the integrals say. I should be able to mumble over all of them, and you'll get the story. But if you like integrals, they're there for that very minor niche audience. All right. So for S4, the idea was we're going to take classical things from what are called state space models, which like most EE people learn in their first year or two. And we're going to update them for deep learning and see how far we can get. And the reason is, is we're thinking about data as a long signal that comes in. I'll explain that in a second. All right. The technical nuggets of these approaches are they're going to be subquadratic. So we're going to be interested in things when we about linear n log n in the sequence length. Okay? It's OK to go farther, higher than that, but that's kind of where mentally we were parked. From signal processing, what people care about in signal processing, what you learn in signal processing is how stable is the system. If the input is bounded, is the output bounded? That's one notion of stability. And they have beautiful characterizations of this. We're going to steal their 30, 40 years of work and put it into our deep learning models. That's going to be our, our goal. And it actually works. And I'll show you it works so that you don't like, you know, see what I mean by works. It's actually, to me, was quite impressive. It was about a 26-point jump on LRA when it came out. Uh, and it was the first one that basically took path X from not working at all to 96. Um, it's still, since then, people have, you know, come in and improved the state of the art, which is wonderful. But this was kind of a, a pretty decent-sized jump when the, when the paper came out. Also, I'll point out, if you look at the image column, sequential CIFAR suggests that spatial bias might not be as important as we thought for image classification for this set of problems. And that's really interesting to me. What are the kind of styles of models that we need as we scale up these you know, bigger and bigger AI models? Maybe we don't need as much kind of you know, structural inductive bias. So I'm super intrigued by that. I don't, I don't have too much to say about it, though. All right. So the first thing about signal processing is it's super general. So we can get into signal processing with basic symbol pushing. We do nothing interesting. We just think that the input is a signal of dimension d that we sampled at n steps. Okay? And the output of this MHA layer is a signal that we sampled at n steps. Okay? So it's mathematically trivial. It has a bias that there's time flowing left to right, which kind of feels like GPT. So that feels kind of nice. But so far, we've done nothing. So why did we do this at all? The reason is signal processing people are super smart. This is the Stanford book that you know, I learned from. And there are two big ideas from signal processing that we're going to borrow. One is not just theirs, but it's a good idea, which is that complex behavior for these signal processing problems can be kind of captured by relatively simple models. And we'll start with the simplest variant of them called what are called LTI systems, linear time invariant systems. I'll show what they are in the next slide. The other thing they have and why they're integrals is they have a beautiful idea, which is because they view the signal as a sample from some underlying continuous function, they can use all kinds of nice continuous mathematics to understand the stability and the other properties, and they don't get stuck in the combinatorial weeds. 
And that was quite inspirational to us. And that's the main idea that we're, we're going to use. OK, they also, as I mentioned, understand stability. And I can explain once I show the math exactly why we know that these things are stable to train, which fixes a lot of the kind of vanishing gradient and exploding gradient problems that we were having previously when we were training these models. OK, so here's what an LTI system is. The U conventionally is the input. So think about it as the input signal. These are all, imagine them as 1D signals. Don't think P here is equal to 1. The X is the hidden state, and the Y is the output. And what the LTI system says is that the hidden state evolves according to two matrices, A and B. Now, machine learning people, we're going to learn the A and B. Basically, it's going to say that the new state, how the new state changes in the hidden state, is proportional to the last state and some function of the input. That's all it's saying. So it's really simple, and those maps are linear. They literally are matrices. And then the output is just a linear projection. Okay? So it's a surprisingly powerful thing. LTI systems you know, are a natural way to start. I'm not saying they capture you know, all of nature. I'm just saying, like, might as well start here, and then we see where they're deficient. Now, one thing that's amazing about LTI systems, if you remember your things called integrating factors, they have closed form solutions. And you don't need to know how this closed form solution came up, but basically you can write them as this convolutional looking integral. Okay? So there's a closed form solution. So now we can understand and study exactly what's going on in that integral, and that tells us how our system is going to behave. And that's what we're going to use to develop basically all of the theory that comes next. The other thing is they have a natural notion of continuous and discrete functions. So there's a continuous version, which I just talked about, but then you sample it at some points, and that gives you the discrete version. And so we naturally have these two things. One thing I would say almost instantly is this gives us something surprisingly non-trivial, which is that discrete version has two kinds of functional forms, which you may rep recognize from other things. The top one is the RNN view. You can check the math, but basically it's a recurrence that says, to predict the next hidden state, I only need the last hidden state plus some little bit of computation. Okay? These are all in a blog, by the way, that's, that's linked from this. And the second one is that there's a convolution underneath the covers. Now, in principle, that means inference can be done with a recurrence, which is super efficient, which is why we love LSTMs and all the rest of those things. But they're not easy to learn because you have to do this crazy backprop. Here, learning is really efficient in principle if we can do convolutions, and we'll talk about how there's a thing which is not surprisingly called flash convolution that does exactly this. Okay. All right, so the recap is we have this nice continuous view. The classical result from signal processing says if the matrix A has all of its real parts, their complex values, eigenvalues, negative, then when I take E of a th something that has that property, it's inside the disk, it's not going to blow up, basically. When I multiply A a bunch of times in that recurrence, everything stays bounded. Okay, so it comes sometimes called the Ruth Hurwitz condition. So this means while we're learning, we have a super trivial condition to ensure on A. Just make sure that all of its roots are in the left-hand side of the plane. Its eigenvalues are in the left-hand side of the plane. And that will be enough to ensure stability. Okay? One other thing is people look at these and they say, well, convolutional models, those have been around forever. And they have been. And actually, people even did variants like this. But these are long convolutional models. Here, the filter that we're doing the convolution is not a three by three kind of kernel. It's as long as the entire input. And that turned out to be really important to pull out huge different kinds of subtle interactions as we went. Okay. Now, I'm going to go through these really, really quickly in the interest of time. But basically, the naive implementation is quite slow. And the reason it's quite slow here is twofold. One is, it looks like we're having to materialize a ton of hidden information, because at every time step, we're having to keep all of the state. If we did that, it turns out it would be no slower, it would be no faster than transformers. The idea is trivial. Rather than materializing the hidden state, we only represent the output. And this mathematical trick, where the hidden state is actually never materialized, is what makes these models so efficient. They do not have to materialize any of the hidden state as they go, okay? which is different from things that people were doing before. There's also this nasty matrix exponential. I will save you the six papers we wrote about various ways to deal with the matrix exponential. Effectively, people now use kind of a diagonal plus a little bit of, a little bit of extra stuff for A. But matrix exponentials are nasty to compute in a differentiable, nice ways. But there's a bunch of ways you can do it that are kind of classical. You just need a fast convolution. And enter Dan and Herman, both who are on the market this year. Dan on the faculty market and Herman uh, looking for PhDs and other jobs. And they got convolutions in these long forms to run at about 65% utilization, which is up from the 2% utilization that you get from traditionally running what's called QFFT, which is the NVIDIA supported library. Okay, All right. So the last thing I wanted to talk about was this gap on language. 
So these models like S4 were really interesting because they did really well on LRA where transformers didn't do well, but they didn't do as well on, on language out of the box. S4 is about five points lower on perplexity, controlling for other factors, which is like the difference between 125 million and a 6.7 you know, billion parameter model. It's quite a big difference. So we went back to the kind of classics here, and there's a classical paper about this task called associative recall that I highlighted here, and a bunch of other people have looked at this. And the idea is you have keys and values, which are letters and numbers, and you just are given a, a database of keys and values, and at the end, you're asked a question. What's the value for A? And you have to return it. Okay, this is a simple synthetic language. Attention can do this trivially, right? You can imagine how the attention would do it. S4 and some successors really, really struggled with this. And this was a really big clue to us because a lot of language, it turns out, actually has a lookup quality to it, an earlier lookup quality to it. This model, which I won't talk too much about, except to say that it allows for what are called data-dependent convolutions, hyena, was the first that allowed you to actually be able to solve variants of this task. There's still more to do, by the way. I don't want to say that everything is solved. This solved one variant of this task and actually got to nearly state-of-the-art uh, perplexity on language. And there'll be a couple of successors that are coming out. And it has, you know, that linear scaling. This allowed us to do something super cool, Eric's paper, which allowed us to do uh, DNA prediction. So just take in base pairs of DNA and predict the next one. Crazily enough, although this paper just got accepted to NeurIPS, people are using it. Like we get user requests and things from like people who know about the human body. I find the human body disgusting, so I try not to pay attention, but like they seem to be doing interesting stuff with it. When I said it didn't solve everything, I wanted to highlight Simran and Sabri. It's this idea that effectively, what you really want to do in language is not just have one lookup, you want to have multiple lookups at various different distances back. And it turns out that actually that slice of data completely explains the difference between transformer models and these, all these convolutional models that, that are there. And the paper will come out soon. Basically, the attention models do really well on these kind of bigrams and multigram lookup parts of the, the data set. If you pull them out, then actually the convolutional models do better on language modeling on the other part of the slice. And the question is, how do you get the best of both worlds? And my guess is, you know, we're working on it. I know three or four other labs are working on it. Someone's going to solve this. And hopefully, we'll have models that are both efficient and doing you know, state of the art, as best we know, everywhere on language relatively soon. The last little bit I was going to mention very, very quickly was that you know, I talked about subquadratic a lot. But there was this lurking quadratic problem in the feed forward network. And what I wanted to point out was that actually there's a bunch of work we did on this thing called Monarch and sparsity. It was the first time people got wall clock speed up with sparsity. The technique was you'd use sparsity about 90% of the computation, and then at the end you'd densify. But while you were running that 90%, you wanted something that was really efficient. It turns out we wrote a bunch of theory papers that like this format of matrices is actually, you know, has a bunch of really nice expressivity properties. It turns out that you can actually perfectly classify linear transformations and into buckets of, of uh, complexity and what they have to be written down as. You can't do that for matrix matrix multiplying. Okay? There's a paper that just came out. I'll just point it out. One of my favorite papers was from 2015. This is nothing we had to do with. It was called MLP Mixer. I just love this paper because it also asked this question like, what is the inductive bias? And they're like, we'll put, mix, we'll put MLPs everywhere. And it works pretty awesome. I was like, that. I coded it up right away and, and all the rest. It's a wonderful paper. MLP Mixer said, what if I replace those MLPs with these monarchs uh, that are there? And it turns out that it does OK. Like, you can match BERT-style performance with a lot fewer perform or with parameters, and it's a lot, lot faster, like you know, 10x faster, 9.1x faster at, at 4K sequences. Okay. So the last kind of thought I wanted to leave you with is this, you know, is AI rare everywhere? And I guess I would just say my intuition of having worked on these problems for the last two years from the outside and why it's kind of, to me, kind of an academic or a research call to arms is, my guess is it's everywhere. This stuff is way more robust than you might think. If it were really fragile, how come every lab can produce numbers that are within a margin of error of each other? Like, this stuff is pretty remarkable and can be done in a huge number of ways. If we get locked into what we're doing right now, I think we're missing a lot of opportunities to build some really exciting AI systems. I also wanted to tell you that I think there's a really bright future for systems and AI. I always get this question where people are like, well, systems and AI are, is great, but you have to be at a big company to do this stuff. It's not true. Like, it's really not true. You can do this in academia. We're still at the toy problem phase for a lot of this. Inference right now is a war in industry. Honestly, the startups are all fighting, you know, together's fighting, all the rest, to get the fastest inference there. But still, some of the best papers, like VLLM came out of our friends at Berkeley, right? Speculative decoding was a, was a Google paper, but came out and was pretty exciting. Flash decode came out from, you know, Tree and those folks. Of course, MQA, GQA, all the rest. Like, 
it's a really rich and interesting area where actual advances are possible. We haven't even touched high throughput systems. What happens when foundation models aren't just answering chat, but are processing a million documents? Say, hey, agent, go look through a million documents and find me everything I should be worried about. We don't know how to build those high throughput systems. We started thinking about that and wrote a couple papers there. So that's all I really wanted to say. Thank you so much. I just wanted to share with you that you know, there's some building blocks for these foundation models. IO aware things like flash attention. I think speed will lead to quality for a while. I'll just say something provocative. I think we're probably 10 or 100 times off the speed that we'll be able to train these models, both in terms of the data and the actual underlying algorithms. I think there are huge advances. We are at the first innings of these things that takes away nothing from the giants who got us here. People are like, oh, well, does that mean like those people were dumb? How could you say that? Look how awesome this stuff is. Do you not play with it every day? Like I honestly play with this stuff nearly constantly and I, I couldn't be happier. Like my wife used to make fun of like my weird demos that I would build at home that like, I'd like, look, I can turn up and play a song, you know, over my phone 10 years ago. And she's like, you know, the volume would get too loud and I couldn't, <laughs> you couldn't turn it off and all the rest. It's pretty amazing what's going on, but there's still a lot more to do. So thanks so much for your time and attention. Thank you so much for a very interesting talk. We have uh, some time for questions. Hi, uh, I know a little bit about RedNet, and I was I, I noticed similarities. I I'm curious how RedNet is different than yeah. So RedNet stuff. came after S4. They do some chunking pieces there. So what uh, RedNet is basically doing is it has an, a, a sliding window style attention in a chunking mode, and so what that's going to do is it's going to allow you to get closer uh, bigrams that fill in over short distances. It basically runs the same S4 mechanism across the top. Um, there's a new paper called Mamba from Albert and team, which shows kind of the, the differences between those folks. RetNet uh, falls down in the exact same way as all of these other models, exactly where you would expect. And there's a paper coming out from Simran and Sabri that shows exactly where it breaks down. Where it's going to break down is, as I said, any kind of long range correlations. I think there's probably three or four different ways to get around that that like people are are you know coming up with over time. Um, but yeah, so it's really exciting. Retnet's a really exciting one. The Blink DL folks put out a really nice paper about doing that. That also falls down in kind of the same way, uh, having the same slice on a pile. Um, and Hyena has the issue too when you go to these multi-query things. So all of them seem to have kind of this issue. My sense is it gets wrung out in kind of a nice way over a little while. I think the chunking is hard because when you do chunking, you lose the inference and some of the other nicer properties that are there. So ideally, we could avoid chunking. Chunking is kind of a natural strategy that people use for benchmarks. But it's, it's a very, very cool paper, very cool line of work. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, how does the scaling law look like? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so great question. So the scaling laws for these uh, things are pretty interesting. And so there's different ways to kind of measure them. The traditional way you do a scaling law is kind of number of parameters and some amount of quality. But here, because you have a parameter kind of means something different, could, do you want to do it by parameters or do you want to do it by flops, for example, the amount of computation you're doing? So there's different ways that you can tune that. And there's a bunch of kind of interesting pieces there. I'll say that what's going to happen, at least from us and a couple of other folks, is that people are going to release the bigger and scaled up versions of them. Uh, as I mentioned, the Blink DL folks released something nice, I think up to 14 billion parameters that they were getting their scaling laws. There's a wonderful paper that whose author I was stalling so I could remember, I can't remember, who did the LSTM scaling laws paper that was really nice that just came out about a year ago. Um, so those scaling laws, I think the rough version of it is that you know there's differences in those curves as you measure them, but they're not so wildly or fundamentally different right now. But we'll see, we're gonna release some scaling laws for a successor to Hyena relatively soon, and I look forward to like three or four other of those coming out. It's a really wonderful way uh, to, look at, to look at the underlying computation. But the difference is there, do you wanna normalize by parameters or by flops? By parameters, they're kind of in one regime. By flops, they're, they're quite a bit different, right? Uh, both in inference time and in overall training flop capacity. Yeah. But it's a, it's a fascinating area. Yeah. Cool. We have time for one last question. So for the context of what stability means here, like I always say, uh, I always thought of an, a stable or unstable system 
I'll look at the at the oscillation, the rise time. Sure. So in this context, what is marginal stability under stable, like a stable, what is the yeah, rise awesome. time in this case? So yeah, so I glossed over this quickly. So when you look at the, so one way to see it is to look at the RNN formulation of what's going on there. And what you're talking about here is kind of like a Bebo stability if you're familiar with it. So what you're trying to do is you wanna make sure your gains for the matrix that you're multiplying again and again and again are inside the unit disk. So what will happen is the phase will change, but the magnitudes will shrink to zero. So it just means that like, if I give you input, it's not gonna wildly blow up. So it really only solves, solves kind of the exploding gradient problem uh, mechanically. It doesn't solve, for example, that the gradients, for example, could vanish. One thing that saves you there, though, is that rather than having to do the, you know, mechanically do the backprop, you can actually do the filter kind of all at once. And a lot of the papers, what they do, this is getting really into the weeds of what stability means, because you just mentioned the undersampled regime. What they have to do is you have to initialize in a particular way that a, because the first part of the filter gets hit on every update, the last high frequency doesn't get hit that often. Just picture the filter kind of going across. And what that means is that you end up having to kind of normalize in an interesting way to fix the second problem that you mentioned. The other way that you fix this is in the hyena style architectures. You don't represent the high frequencies in Fourier domain. You do them as kind of a small shift in time. So you actually slide a window across. And so you're seeing people do that to compensate for the fact that you do get numerical instability, which you kind of can't avoid because you're way over the square root n limit uh, at the end of the filter. So that's what I mean by stability kind of precisely. It's the eigenvalue spectrum was the, the uh, vanishing piece or the exploding piece. And then the vanishing piece I didn't talk about too much because it involves this weird initialization that we spent five years on and don't know how to succinctly explain. Thank you very yeah. much. Thanks for the great question. Awesome. Thank you so much. Let's awesome. thank uh, Chris again so much. for a very interesting talk. <laughs>